Hello and welcome back to session nine of the new creation teaching series. We made it to session nine uh, and this session is entitled Law and Grace. It will be very interesting and exciting. And today we are going to pick up some of the things that we discussed in the last three sessions, sessions six, seven and eight. And we will, I will, I'll try to bring even more clarity on grace and on the things that we discussed from the perspective of law, of law and grace. Uh, so today, in the today's session, if you are ready, we'll, uh, I'll make a summary. We'll discuss uh, about what, is, what does it mean to be under the law versus under grace. Then we will discuss why we are, uh, the new creation is no longer under the law. And then we'll talk about a little bit about the issue of motivation in the process of sanctification under grace. And we'll talk about different wrong motivations and correct motivation for holiness. And I think that will be it uh, for this session. We have a lot to cover again, not, not as much as the previous session. This session will be shorter. I'll try to keep it under one hour. So if you're ready, let's start with uh, the first part of the session. What does it mean to be under the law? And what, then what does it mean under, uh, to be under grace? And then we'll, we'll put them together face to face. And I hope that by the Holy Spirit, we will see clearly what does it mean? What are the differences? What are the similarities between the two covenants, between the two systems of, um, of God? So under the law, and both under the law and under grace, there are, I, I tried to systematize it, and I found that there were four, four characteristics uh, uh, of both being under law and being under grace. And with the help of these characteristic attributes, we'll be able to compare the two systems in a very clear way. So under the law, there were four attributes. There was, uh, the first one was expectation. The second one means of meeting that, those expectations. Then it was the motivation for meeting the expectation. And the fourth attribute was the absolution whenever people did not meet the expectation. So again, expectation means motivation and absolution. And I'll, I'll explain what, what it means. So under the law, God expected, the first one, expectation. God expected from the people to fulfill the moral law of God in order to attain righteousness. It was, a, a, it was an expectation to fulfill the moral law, the Ten Commandments especially, as a condition for righteousness. That was the first attribute. The second attribute, the means of fulfilling that expectation, it was pretty much human ability sabotaged by the sin nature inside the people. So it was a human ability to fulfill the law, but it was sabotaged by the sin nature as we have seen so far. The third attribute was the motivation for fulfilling the law. What was the motivation of the people to fulfill the law? And I found that there were about three, maybe there are more, but I found at least three, and these were... Uh, one of fear and, the, and two of love. Uh, the first motivation could have been fear of curses uh, that God presented very clearly in Deuteronomy 28. If you do this, I will bless you. If you don't, I will curse you. So one motivation would, would, could have been fear of curse. The second motivation could have been love for blessings. I want, they wanted to be blessed. So if they wanted to be blessed more, they, they had to obey more. And the third, which is the most commendable, would have been love for God and for His ways and for His laws. So these were uh, free of the motivation that people could have had for fulfilling the law of God. And the fourth attribute, the absolution, whenever people uh, did disobeyed the law and broke the law, God provided a way for them to be absolute, to come back to, to a state of blessing and favor. And, and that, method was, that method was by repeated sacrifices of animals. Those cover the sins for a while. So they, uh, they brought all kinds of sacrifices, animal sacrifices to cover their sins. So again, expectation to fulfill the moral law in order to be righteous means to fulfill that role was human ability sabotaged by sin nature. The motivation was fear of curse, love for blessings or love for God and his ways. And absolution, the method of absolution was re through repeated sacrifices of animals. That was under the law. Now we come under the grace and we have the same 
four attributes and the first expectation the expectation of god for people under grace is still to fulfill the moral law but extend the law of god as and the word fulfill is not appropriate for people under grace because it's it's not an expectation to fulfill in the same way as under law but for the sake of comp comparison so the expectation is to fulfill not only the moral law of Moses, but the extended moral law that Jesus Christ extended on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, when he brought the law from an external, from an external way to the internal way. He, he brought the spirit of the law. He said all kinds of these sayings. You, you know that in the law it is said, you should not murder. But I say unto you that if you hate your brother, you are already a murderer. So he brought, he extended the moral law of Moses. He, he made it bigger and more and harder, way harder, impossible to, to obey. So the expectation under grace is bigger than under law is to fulfill the whole law, everything that God is, His nature, to be like God inside and outside. And be, but the, the, there is a little difference. In, under the law, the expectation was to fulfill the Ten Commandments to be in order to be righteous and blessed. Under grace, the expectation is to be exactly like God, to fulfill the whole law, to be holy, because you are already righteous. It's not a condition, but an effect and a result. So the expectation is similar, but a little bit different. Uh, then the means, the second attribute. The means to fulfill that expectation of holiness is, as I mentioned in se session six, it's faith in the grace power of God to work through us, to influence our free choices, our wills, our desires, and our circumstances towards holiness through the righteous nature inside of us. Now, we are no longer sabotaged by the sin nature because we no longer have a sin nature in our spirits, but we have a righteous nature. So now the means is the, is the ability of God, not the, abil not the human ability. And we access that ability of God by faith alone. When we put our faith in the grace of God, that power of God starts to flow through us and affects us and everything around us. The process of our minds, our desires, our wills, are the circumstances so that we would walk in holiness effortlessly and without struggling, without having to read the law and see everything, try to keep everything. You know, people on the law, the Jewish people, they had laws and laws and beside the laws that God gave all kinds hundreds and hundreds of law if you read Leviticus numbers Deuteronomy beside those they had all kinds of other traditions that they added to help them obey the law you don't have to have a list of do's and don'ts under grace you just have faith that God will work through you that bigger and harder and that impossible law of his that Jesus extended in Matthew 5, He will work it out for you when, whenever you are in rest and you trust in Him. So the means are completely different than the means under law. The means under grace are very different from the means under the law. And then we know that the means to obey the law under the law were not successful. They, were, they always failed. And that was a purpose in itself uh, for which God gave the law. And we explained in the previous session. Under grace, the means, the ability of God is a successful one. 100% it will always be successful. Faith will always work. Faith always works. The first attribute under grace is the motivation. The motivation under grace, I found uh, one, two, three, four, five five different motivations that Christians could have for walking in holiness, for sanctifying themselves, for pleasing God, for doing the works of righteousness, right? So the motivation for Christians or believers could be fear of losing salvation or of going to hell. That's the most prominent, uh, and we discussed in detail in session seven and eight. So the fear of losing salvation and of going to hell anytime. The second motivation is the fear of, of curse. Uh, this is similar to the one that people had under law. The third one is love for blessings. I want to be more blessed. So that's why I walk in holiness for, with God. I try to please God so that I will be more blessed. Then the fourth one is, could be love for power. 
There are people that are very sincere and honest and they want to walk in a greater anointing of the Holy Spirit, to see signs and wonders. They want to walk in a greater measure of the power of the Holy Spirit and to bless people. And, and that's why they believe that walking in more holiness will attract more anointing and more power of the Holy Spirit. That's the fourth motivation. And the fifth is love for God and for His ways and laws. And the, uh, the fourth attribute under grace is absolution. Whenever the believer uh, sins or still does sinful actions, the method of absolution is still a sacrifice, but it's only one sacrifice. And you can guess that's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which is given once and for all, for all sins, for all times. So there's no repetition. So now if we summarize again under law and under grace, Expectation, the Ten Commandments, to, in order to be righteous, under grace, the, everything that God is, the whole law, the whole nature of God, because you are already righteous. Under law, the means where human ability is sabotaged by sin nature inside of them. Under grace is faith alone in the grace of God that will bring change in you uh, through the righteous nature that you acquired at the, uh, the new birth. Under law, the motivation was fear of curse, love of blessings, love for God. Under grace, fear of losing salvation, fear of curse, love for blessing, love for power, love for God. And absolution, repeated sacrifices of animals under law. Under grace is the only one sacrifice, eternal sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I think these four categories can help us very clearly to make the difference between un being under law and under grace. And now I, I want to explain in the second part of this session, I want to explain why we are no longer under the law, why the new creation, the believer, is no longer under the law. There has to be an explanation. I don't know if you ever wonder that, and I will explain that here. And if you're ready with your Bibles, let's open our Bibles to Romans 7, 1 to 4. Let's read it together. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Amen. So here, Apostle Paul compares the covenant of marriage with why we had the right to come from under the law, under grace, and to be united with Christ. So if we think about the covenant of marriage, and any covenant before God is a covenant of blood, if you want, but a covenant is made by two parties, between two parties, and is up until death. The, for instance, the covenant of marriage is made until death sets them apart, right? So you are married, any co married couple has a covenant that is uh, that is broken or is finished. The covenant finishes gracefully and nicely whenever one of the parties dies without, without going to another woman or to another man, without being an adulterer, right? So if you're faithful to your wife or to your husband and die of natural causes or of secret or any, any other reason, then the, the other party who remains alive is free to marry another, another woman or another man without have, being an adulterer, without, having, uh, without being a sinner, right? So Paul takes this example and he says, in a covenant, whenever one of them dies, the, the other party is released, of the, the covenant is, is ended. Now when we come to God and Jesus Christ, the human race was in a covenant with God, was married to the law. And what was the law? The first commandment of the law, if you want the law of God, was given to Adam, the first man, to not eat of that tree. That was only one simple command that the man broke. When the man broke that covenant, he became an adulterer. In, in the same sense, in a marriage couple, 
the uh, one of uh, whenever one of them goes to another woman on another uh, another man they become adulterer or us in the same way the human race the whole human race became an adulterer before God and broke the covenant and then God extended that first commandment to the ten commandments sh and showed human race how he is like even more this is how am i this is what am i this is my nature and then jesus christ expands it even more in matthew 5 this is this is really who am i and this is my stand these are all my standards and you you are in a covenant with me you are married to this law but you have broken it and you have died spiritually now jesus christ came in the same covenant with human race and fulfilled the whole law of God in the same marriage with the law, under the law. But Jesus Christ never sinned, never broke the law and fulfilled all the law. And then he died physically and died on the cross. The moment when he died, being married with the law, fulfilling the law of the law, he never broke it and then died. In that moment, the covenant was finished gracefully and nicely, right? that the the covenant uh, the covenant the marriage between jesus christ and the law was finished now jesus christ was free to marry somebody else but in christ not only christ finished that covenant but we were in christ so when we when christ died and we died in christ and christ fulfilled the law we fulfilled the law in christ so when we died in christ we died with him and that is why we were well, the covenant between us and God through the law our marriage with the law was ended nicely and gracefully so now exactly as in a marriage because we ended the covenant and one of the, one of the parties died we died now we are free the new creation is free to marry another one to be joined to Christ so that you may be joined to another to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit of God so God in a just way ended that covenant in Christ and began a new one the covenant of grace under grace that is the reason why we are we came under why we are no longer under law why people are no longer under law uh, and that is awesome that is extraordinary praise be praise be to god praise praise god now let's move on to the issue of motivation in the process of sanctification of holiness of living for god under grace where well, that's the third attribute be, uh, under the law and under grace and that is very important because anything you do in life you will notice that anything you do in life will be will always be out of fear or out of love for someone or of uh, or for something so anything you would do in life is filtered or motivated from fear almost everything maybe there are some of it, but almost everything is motivated by fear or love or or likes and what is interesting is that whenever you run from something that you fear it doesn't last on the long term but but whenever you run towards something that you love from the heart and something that you like usually that lasts you'll always be you will always do and be attracted to what you love to do isn't that right it's it's very it's easier to do something that you like and love than doing something out of fear or fret or constraint isn't that right so that will apply also in our process of of sanctification of and living before god after salvation doing those works of righteousness out of faith and i will discuss first the wrong motivations the first one was fear of losing salvation under grace especially fear of losing salvation and going to hell and we discussed this uh, that our salvation is secure the free the our condom gift of condemnation is free and forever we are justified forever we discussed that in details in session seven and eight and here we put everything together so this is the first wrong motivation and receiving the eternal free gift of no condemnation forever and of salvation secu uh, security is one of the secrets of holiness and sanctification that the devil tries to keep the devil tries to keep hidden from christians from the children of god the gift and the freedom of no condemnation forever whenever you're free of condemnation in your mind and you realize that you are free you're not under condemnation anymore any longer 
that will produce in you holiness as a result because you'll no longer be fretted or constrained. Every constraint is taken out of the way. And if you notice in John 8, 10 to 12, well, when that, adulter, that woman was caught in adultery and was brought to be, to be stoned, Jesus at the end offered her first the gift of no condemnation to the, that woman caught in adultery. And then she said her, to her, go and sin no more. She didn't tell her first, go and sin no more and I will not condemn you. She's, he said, I, I don't condemn you. Where are you, all your accusers? And the woman said, there are no, no more accusers, Lord. And the Lord said, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Because that gift, free gift of no condemnation will give you the right motivation and the joy to go and sin no more. And I'll give you an example here, example of a circus. They are all in a circus. There are all kinds of acrobats and they do a lot of training and exercises. Now I have a question for you. Whenever an acrobat prepares for the spectacle, for the show, when they do their training, their exercises, how is easier for that acrobat to perform better and try more new things? The one who has the ground below him, whenever he exercises things on the air and high on those thin things and wires and stuff, is the one who has the ground below him and at the first mistake he is dead, he drops dead and he can die, or the one who has a mattress underneath and who knows that even if he makes a mistake, he or she makes a mistake, he is safe and, and can try again. That's how they train. They always have a mattress below. It's not the ground because if they fall of that altitude, of that height, they, they can hurt themselves. They can be, and even with the mattress, they, sometimes they hurt themselves. But whenever they know they have something to fall off, that, that they are safe, then they can perform better and they can try different things and new things knowing that at the first mistake they will not die. In the same way, if we take this analogy with salvation, it is a much more probability, it's easier to, to, to walk in holiness, to walk in righteousness when you know that at the first mistake you don't lose your salvation. No matter how many mistakes you do, you don't die. You don't die spiritually again. You can perform better. You can walk, you can walk in even greater righteousness when you know that you have a gift of no condemnation. And your life now, the life of the new creation, the life of the believer is like a piece of white paper in which, on which every time a sin tries to be written there, it automatically disappears. It's erased automatically by the blood of Jesus without your confession, without anything that you might do is written, is erased because all of your sins, past, present and future, they're all, all removed once and for all when you became saved when you were born again they were all removed once and for all praise God and God wants you to be holy because of your love for him that's the right motivation and not because of the fear of hell you don't need to fear of hell why this is how the rest of the world lives in integrity and morality because of the fear of the law because if they break the law if they do things outside the law they will go to jail and they fear the law but not you salvation from hell is just the basic is just the beginning of the journey with God God brought us out of darkness and hell free with the purpose to bring us into something else the something else is the main thing, not the salvation from hell. And we see, let's, let's open our Bibles to Deut Deuteronomy 6, 22 to 23. And let's read about the people of Israel, how they were uh, saved from Egypt with a purpose. Moreover, Deuteronomy 6, 22, 23. Moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh and all his household. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in, to give us the land which he had sworn to our father. God's purpose or reason or focus with the people of Israel in bringing them out from Egypt was to bring them into something else. The deliverance from Egypt was, was just a necessary required step for the in. The in was conditioned on the from. Most Christians today celebrate the fact that they are free in Christ, 
But that is not what Jesus wants. God did not want the people of Israel just to rejoice after they crossed the Red Sea and just remain there in the wilderness, right? He didn't want them to stay there. He prepared something for them. Now, notice that the text does not say he brought us out and he brought us in. But it does say he brought us out from there in order to bring us in. The goal is the in, not the out. The final purpose of God for the people of Israel was to give them a land of milk and honey, to give them a land of blessing. And most Christians, now if we make the analogy of the people of Israel, there are a lot of analogies. The Red Sea, the passing through the Red Sea, the baptism in the water, the, the Egypt slavery, is the is slavery of sin, and the wilderness and the Canaan, Canaan is the, um, represents the life after we receive Christ, we are baptized in water, our journey with God. So now most Christians are just out. And the problem with this situation is that if they are just out, whatever they have got, they have got out of still pulls them. They are still attracted to that out of. The people of Israel were tempted and ready to return to Egypt multiple times. Why? When they did not see anything but desert and hardships. Egypt still got a hold of them because they did not taste yet the inn. They did not taste the promised land. So as long as they were in wilderness, in the wilderness with the, all the hardship and the desert, they were still pulled towards Egypt. They remembered Egypt and they wanted to go back. They craved back the meat and other stuff from Egypt. In the same way as the, most Christians, because they don't find a, a real satisfaction in the Christian life, they don't enter the inn. And we'll see what the in. What is the promised land for the Christian? What is Canaan for Christian? It is not the future life and the future new heaven and the new earth, but is a place on earth. It might surprise you, and I'll tell you why. Why Canaan for Christian is not the future life or the new heaven and the new earth. It is something for now, it is something real now, but it's spiritual. And the reason is in the new heaven and the new earth, there won't be any giants to conquer or any obstacles. There won't be any sickness to heal. There won't be any uh, uh, struggles, any attacks, any temptation like it was in, in Canaan. There were all the giants, all these giants that people of Israel had to fight with the ability of God to conquer, to enter in the promised land. And those giants, those obstacles are here with us on earth. And also we can kind of grasp and guess what is the promised land for the Christian here on earth, right? It is a spiritual place of rest, of victory, of holiness, of health, prosperity, of life in abundance, grace in abundance. That is the true purpose of Christianity and not just salvation from hell. You are saved from hell to walk in salvation, to be immune to sin, to be immune to sickness, to be immune to poverty, to curse while you are on this earth, to be a testimony of God's salvation, to prove the good, acceptable and perfect will of God by the renewing of your mind, to prove and to be blessed, to be a blessing for people, to be an inspiration, to show people, to make, to help people taste of the goodness of God, of the love of God, to be a testimony of God's goodness. And this is what we're going to talk a, a little bit more in the next session about the inheritance of the new creation here on earth we will talk in detail but here i want to point out that the fear this motivation of the fear of losing salvation going to hell it's a wrong motivation and it's false because once you are genuinely saved that's just uh, just the beginning the salvation of hell god will never return you back to hell once you are saved but he wants you to taste to go in to the inheritance that he has prepared for you by the blood of jesus jesus paid so much not just to save you from hell but to bring you into his inheritance the second wrong reason is the fear of curses the fear, and that is the fear of not being blessed or losing the blessings of God if we are not holy enough or pleasing to God enough, if we don't walk in, in holiness enough and if we don't, don't do enough works of righteousness. Under the law, 
this fear of curse was justified as a motivation because of Deuteronomy 28 where God presents the condition. If you do this, I will bless you so on and on. Uh, if you don't, I will curse you. And all kind, if you read the whole chapter of Deuteronomy 28, you will see the conditions, the blessing for fulfilling the conditions and the curses for breaking the conditions. So under the law, they would, re they would really experience curse if they did not obey the law. But under grace, as you can, uh, you can guess already, this is not true under grace at all. You will never experience curse. And I repeat, you will never as a believer, as a new creation in Christ, you will never experience curse because you have not been holy enough. The blessing of the new creation does not depend on your holiness, on my holiness at all, but on Christ's holiness only. Our blessing, every blessing that we receive as, as, a, as believers is de depends on Christ's holiness who, which is perfect. Not on your holiness, not on your works of righteousness, not, not on how holy you are or walk, but on Christ's holiness that He lived on earth and He has given it to us. That's the only condition for your blessing. And we see that in Galatians uh, 3.13. Let's read it together. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. What is the curse of the law? The curse, all the, these curses of the law are summarized pretty much in Deuteronomy 28. Got the punishments that would come if pe the people of Israel did not fulfill the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, meaning that he paid the, the whole penalty of every breaking of the law, every, every disobedience of the law for us and in us. He paid completely. He fulfilled those conditions. And in Matthew 5, 17 and 18 says this, do not think, Jesus says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill, to fulfill the law. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is accomplished. So Jesus did not only redeem us from the curse of the law, but he also fulfilled the whole law. All the Deuteronomy 28 conditions and not only, he fulfilled them all for us and in us. And now we are entitled only to blessings without doing anything good or bad. And even when you sin, you are still entitled only to blessings. Curses are no longer for you because Jesus Christ fulfilled all the conditions of the law, fulfilled the whole law, and you are in Christ forever. So you fulfill the law, you fulfilled all the conditions of the law, so you are only blessed. Even if you still do sinful actions, you are absolutely, you are covered, you are, your sins are all removed by Jesus' sacrifice, which is eternal. So because Jesus Christ fulfilled all the conditions, you are entitled, I am entitled, and you are entitled only to blessings. Your blessings do not depend on how much you obey God or obey the law or try to be holy. Let's see one more verse. 2 Corinthians 1.20. A lot of Christians know this verse. That all the promises of God in Him are yes and amen. What are the promises of God? So 2 Corinthians 1.20. What are the promises of God? The ones in Deuteronomy 28, uh, and not only, the promises of God are health by Jesus' stripes, are prosperity in this life, uh, pro good success, not bad success, done through all kinds of illegal things, good success. The Psalm 1 says that the righteous one, the righteous person, righteous man, on whatever he puts his hands, he prospers. That's a big promise for us that the believer is entitled to walk in prosperity, to walk in blessing. And prosperity is not only money. It's good success, it's favor of God in your family, in your job, in your ministry, in everything you touch, everything you are. It's good success and advancement. And I'll talk probably in a future series uh, on details about prosperity and true prosperity with God. Another promise is blessing, power, the power of the Holy Spirit, victory, success. These promises are all yes in Christ and amen. Why? Because Christ has fulfilled the conditions to receive those promises. And He just, he just given, has given it to us freely. 
without us doing anything, without our holiness. These promises do not depend on our walk of holiness. So don't worry. Don't try to be holy to be more blessed. That's the wrong motivation. You are holy because you love God. The third motivation is love for blessings. Uh, it seems like a noble motivation, but it's, 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 not, it's not really. Under the law, the more you obeyed, the more blessed you were. That was under the law. But under grace, being more holy will not bring you more blessings. You cannot be more blessed than you already are. Let's see Romans 8, 17. And if children, and if we are children of God, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, or joint heir with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. The believer in Christ is a joint heir with Christ. That means everything that Christ has and is, you have, I have, and you are, and I am. Everything that Christ is. So that's everything that Christ is entitled to. 1 Corinthians 3, 21 to 23. So then let no one bo boast in men, Paul says, for all things belong to you, to Christians. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things belong to you. And you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. The world, all things present and things to come, they all belong to, to but the believer in Christ, to all the believers in Christ. So that means all blessings. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. At past tense, He has blessed us. And we will see in a future session that the spiritual blessings include physical blessings. Uh, let's see one more. 2 Peter 1.3 says this, seeing that His divine power, Peter says, has granted to us, the new creation, everything pertaining to life, to this life and godliness, through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. So you are already blessed. That's not a correct motivation for being holy because you will not be more blessed if you are holier. You are not holy. You do not walk in holiness in order to be blessed, but because you are blessed. And the fourth wrong motivation is love for power or desire for more power of the Holy Spirit, which again seems noble and it's a, it's a good desire, but not as a motivation for holiness. You are not holy to attract more anointing and more power of the Holy Spirit. Under the law, again, the, you see, we compare the law and the grace. Under the law, the more people obeyed, the more power and anointing of God they attracted. And I'll give you an example. 2 Chronicles 7.14 I know this is a passage that a lot of Christians love and quote whenever there's a prayer time of fasting. And this passage says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What do you think? Does the, from, considering everything that we learned so far, do you think this passage still applies for the believer in Christ, for the new creation? You will notice if you read the whole Old Testament under the law, there will always be a condition. God will always say, if you do this, I will do that. If you don't, I won't. And this passage sounds the same way. If my people turn from their wicked ways, in other words, they are holier, they are uh, sanctified, they, they become more holy, then I will hear from heaven, then I will forgive their sins, and then I will heal the land or I will heal them. That is not for the Christian in Christ. The believer in Christ has received the forgiveness of sin, the justification forever as a gift, free gift, unconditional gift, without works, without, apart from the works of the law. So for the believer in Christ, there's no longer a condition to turn from my wicked ways in order for God to hear me, to hear my prayer, to forgive my sin or to heal me. That not, does not apply to the new creation. It was for people under the law who did not have Christ, not for people under grace. And I'll give you another example. The example of Achan in Joshua 7, when the people of Israel lost battles, lost the battle with the city of Ai, 
because of the sin of Achan, which who took some of the treasures that God said, no, said, God said, oh, whole Jericho is yours. But he took some of the treasures and because of his sin, the people of Israel uh, um, lost some battles, people were killed and they did not advance forward because of sin. That does not apply in the new covenant in under grace. Uh, one, more ex uh, one more example of the difference, very clear difference between people under law and people under grace. Let's read Exodus 19, 5, 6. Now then, if you will, if, again, if, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples from, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the son of Israel. You see, again, if you do this, if you obey my voice, my covenant, you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's in the Old Testament, in Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. Now we come in, in the New Testament under grace at 1 Peter 2, 9. And it says this, with no ifs, no conditions, God says this through Apostle Peter, but you are not you shall be you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation a people for god's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light you are now you don't need to do the ifs to obey the voice to do the covenant in order to be a kingdom of priests a royal priesthood you are because you are in Christ you have become my people you have become my possession my royal priesthood my holy nation again here you see a clear difference uh, be between people under law and people under grace uh, between the mentality of the Old Testament and the mentality of the New Testament and the the mindset of the Old Testament and the New Testament under grace having more power and anointing does not depend on your holiness or my holiness at all but on faith alone in christ alone he has given us he has given us all the power that we need galatians 3 5 says this paul says this so then does he who provides you with the spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith what does Paul says this? That the Spirit is provided and miracles are worked by hearing with faith alone, not by works of the law. John 3, 34. Let's read it together. Jesus says, For he, John says, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For he, God, gives the Spirit without measure. In this context, it talks about Jesus, that Jesus came and sent, was sent to speak the words of God, and God gave him the Spirit without measure. But now look at John 20, 21, what, the, what John says, Jesus says. So Jesus said to them again, to the disciples, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So Jesus was sent by God to speak the words of God. He had the Spirit without measure. And now Jesus said that exactly in the same way that the Father has sent me, I send you. What does that mean? That, that we also have the Spirit without measure. We have the Holy Spirit in us without measure just by being born again. We see, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon. When does the Holy Spirit come upon you? At salvation. And we will talk in a future session about this. But you have the Holy Spirit without measure in you. Mark 16, 17, 18. Let's read it together. Jesus says, These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. But what's the condition? Those who have believed. Faith is the only condition. So it's not, not our works, not our, our holiness. You have faith, power, all the power that you need by faith alone. You don't need to use it as a motivation to walk in holiness. Acts 3, 12 and uh, verse 16. Peter, when Peter healed that beggar at the, uh, at the gate of the temple. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people. Uh, notice his re uh, reply. 
Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety, piety we had made him walk? So what Peter is saying is, says here, I did not make that beggar lame walk by my own power or my own piety, piety, my own holiness, my own uh, godliness. And then in 16 says this, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man who you see and, and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. What was the, the power that, uh, that made that man uh, well and performed the miracle that attracted the power of the Holy Spirit was faith in Jesus' name. That's the only condition, not Peter's holiness, not Peter's righteousness, but faith in Jesus' name. That concludes the fourth, uh, the fourth wrong motivation for holiness. So until now we covered the fear of losing salvation, the fear of curse, the love for blessings and love for power. And now we're moving to the correct motivation for holiness. And which I said it was love for God and for His ways and for the neighbor. And that is the fulfillment of the law. But love for God is the correct motivation to walk in holiness, to, to do the works of righteousness. That's the result, the effect of being already made righteous and loving God. Let's see Romans 5, 5 says this. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the love of God was already poured out into our hearts at salvation through the Spirit that was given to us. The love, the ability to love God, to love people, it's already in you by the new birth, by the birth, the, by the new creation. The new creation has already the love of God in, in it, in him, in her. Because God has put it there by the Spirit. When the Spirit was given to you at salvation, He has put all His love there, the ability to love Him and to love people. Galatians 5, 6 says this, Paul says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. Here I want to say a few things. Faith can work perfectly without love. You can move mountains, you can perform signs and wonders, you can have faith without love. A lot of people say that they cannot have faith because they don't have enough love. And because of that, they don't have enough faith. No. The Bible says that 1 Corinthians 13, 2 says this, If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries, mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. So you can have faith to move mountains, but if you don't have love, it is nothing, doesn't count for anything. And even here in Galatians 5, 6, Paul says, yes, you can have faith, you can have, but faith without love, does not count for anything in Christ. You can do mighty works just through faith. However, if it's not through love, it does not count in Christ as a work of righteousness worthy of reward. The same says the 1 Corinthians 13. If you have all faith to remove mountains but do not have love, it does not work through love. It is nothing. I am nothing. So you cannot expect to receive a reward for a, a work of faith that is out of love. And dead works are, are either works without faith, because the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. So whenever we do works out of self-righteousness, but not through faith, works of holiness, but without faith, those are dead works. Dead works means that you will not receive a reward from them. They don't count for anything in Christ. They, don't, they are nothing. They are self-righteous. So dead works are either works of holiness, of righteousness made without faith, or works of faith, but without love. So motivation plays a very significant role in our life of holiness. That's the correct motivation. And everything we do in ministry for people, for, uh, for God, has to come out of love for Him, not out of other motivation, which can be noble, can be nice, but they are not the correct motivation. So dead works are works without faith or works of faith without love. You will not be rewarded for those spirits. And 1 John 4, 16 to 19 says this. 
John says this, We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. We see two things here, uh, two important things. Love and fear cannot coexist. If you fear, you don't love. And if you love, then you don't fear. If you are wholly out of fear, it cannot be out of love in the same time. And if you are wholly out of love, then it cannot be out of fear. And that is what lasts. Holiness and everything we do in ministry for people, for God, has to come out of love. And verse 18 says, There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For, because fear involves punishment. Punishment of hell, fear of losing your salvation, fear of curse, fear. God wants you to love without fear. Have no fear of anything. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. So God says, now you can not to fear. So don't fear, but walk in love. And the second thing I want to mention here is, is that we love because He first loved us. Our ability to love Him and love people lies on grasping and meditating, on receiving the revelation on how much He loved us first on His love, when you meditate on His love. This is the purpose of this session, to see, to unveil, to unfold the grace of God, to see how much God has given us, how much God uh, has given us His love. And when you see that, when you know that He only loves you, he, He's always on your side, He will never accuse you, He will always love you, then you become free to love Him back, love Him more out of your heart. And that is the purpose of everything we discuss here, that God will always be for you and on your side. He will always love you. This is the truth. He will never accuse you. He will never condemn you. He will never put you back to death. He will always love you even if, when you mess up, even when you do mistakes. God causes all things to work for good. Abraham did two mistakes. He gave, he, twice he, he lied that his wife was his sister and uh, his wife Sarah was taken. But even when Abraham did those mistakes god has mercy had mercy on him and he saved abraham and sarah without even them asking or even when they did mistakes so god will also be on your side when you sin or even when you sin when you blow when you when you fall into sin god will love you even then you don't have to fear when even if you sit, sin repeatedly yes of course god wants you to come out of there for you because you have so much, there's such a big inheritance and sin keeps you away, keeps, sin kills your faith and keeps you away of your inheritance. That's why God wants you not to sin. Not because He said so, not because of the fear of hell, but because of you, because He loves you and He wants you to enjoy His inheritance. He wants you to enjoy life, to enjoy His joy, to enjoy peace. And these all, these, all these motivations were our lives, are things that keep us in bondage and keep us from moving forward freely in holiness. I would like to conclude. So the expectation, the, that first attribute, the expectation and the way of absolution, the fourth attribute, expectation and absolution, are similar in both sides, under law and under grace, but at different levels. Because of the expectation was just the moral law under, under, under the law, under grace is the whole law of God. Everything that God is, but out of righteousness is an effect, not as a condition. And the absolution under law was repeated animal sacrifice, repeated sacrifices of animals. Under grace is the sacrifice of Jesus. But the difference is, what makes the difference between the two, the, between under law and under grace, is the correct means applied with the correct motivation. So not just the means, but the right motivation. Are, we, are, are the Christians and the believers in Christ under the law? They are completely not under the law because everything is changed. 
even the expectation and the absolution they are completely different they are similar but very different are the believers under any constraints or fears to perform works of righteousness or holiness in reality in actuality no in actuality the truth the knowledge of the truth is that the christian has no constraints no fears no threats only the wrong beliefs and the strongholds of our minds as believers put constraints and threats over us only the wrong beliefs that's the purpose of this teaching to take out all the obstacles all the wrong beliefs all the strongholds and renew our mind so that we will live freely and enjoy the freedom of christ uh, uh, two more questions in conclusion why do we walk in holiness what is the correct motivation because of love for god out of love for god how do we walk in holiness and we said that in detail in session six by grace through faith amen and in the end of this session i would also like to so we, what we discussed if i were to summarize again we discussed today uh, uh, those four categories categories of seeing the difference between under law and under grace expectation means motivation absolution why we the christian and the believer in christ is no longer under the law the issue of motivation four wrong motivations and the the correct one and and then we concluded the the why is because of love the motivation is out of love and the the means under grace are by faith by grace through faith and the two verses to memorize that i prepared today are from romans 8 17 and from galatians 5 6. let's read it together romans 8 17 and if children heirs also heirs of god and fellow heirs with christ if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him those sufferings are not sufferings of sickness not sufferings of poverty those sufferings are sufferings of persecution persecution sufferings for the name of christ and we will see maybe that when we talk about healing the series on physical healing divine healing let's personalize if i am a child of god i'm an heir also an heir of god himself and a joint heir with christ if indeed i suffer with him so that i may also be glorified with him and galatians 5 6 for in christ jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love for in christ jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love may god bless you and until the next session until we meet again be blessed and i hope and i pray that the holy spirit will open the eyes of our hearts to see and assimilate this and believe in the truth of the gospel believe the truth of the gospel of christ the power of the gospel of christ that the blood of jesus that has made us free freely god has given us all things freely by the blood of jesus it is free but not cheap if the, the all things that we receive from God are free, but they are not cheap. They are all paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. But thank you, Jesus, especially for not giving up while you are on this earth. Thank you for fulfilling the law for us. Thank you for dying for us, for sacrificing yourself for us and going to the cross for us. Thank you, but by your body, by your blood, we have forgiveness of sin. We have healing. We have a great inheritance and we are a part of the household of God himself. We are heirs with you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for such an opportunity, for such a privilege. Thank you for being our Lord, being the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And we worship you and we thank you with everything that we are. And Father, we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would help us will you would cause us to walk in holiness out of love for you and by faith by grace father and out of love for you and not out of motivation other other reasons other things that are not proper father we want to love you with a genuine authentic love as exactly as you loved us you loved us with a sincere love with an honest love and you gave everything because you loved us father not because other reasons too because you were bored or because you wanted somebody to share with or because you, not other reasons just because out of your love father help us to reciprocate that and out of love 
to love, to walk in holy, to love you, to love people. And we thank you that we know that you are on our side. We thank you and in the name of Jesus and by the, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we worship you. Amen. Be blessed.